back to that yeah. rumor mill because that is a name that's been out there before the DeMar DeRozan deal went down. We heard the Kings, potentially Golden State. It seems like the trade talks have cooled off for now. Does it stay that way in your opinion? Do you think it's going to pick back up? Where does he ultimately land in your opinion? And and if there is a move, when does it happen? Listen, if we've learned anything from Danny Age, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, but he's going to try to get everything he can from the team that he is going to trade with. We saw that with the Donovan Mitchell situation. The Knicks were willing to give a whole lot up for Donovan Mitchell, but Danny Ainge wanted more. He got more from Cleveland. In his mind, I don't think he did, but whatever. Different story. That's of the past. But bringing it back to Lori, listen, I absolutely love his game. I mean, he averages four points per game, almost eight and a half rebounds, shoots almost 50% from the floor, almost 40% from the three. He has drastically gotten better since he first began his career. He's only 27 years old. So I do think that there is a high market for him. I like him in OKC. I think he would be a perfect fit with that young team that they have. He's a skilled shooter. He's a rebounder. He brings so many different um, assets to a team. He has so many different depths of his game. So many bags to his game, rather, I should say. Um, like I said, it's a matter of if he gets, um, when he gets traded, not necessarily if. I think he's too much of an asset for what they're trying to do in Utah, which is, I think, rebuild. Utah's weird. They've always kind of gotten close, not close enough, and now they've gotten rid of Donovan Mitchell and a lot of other pieces. They just haven't really been able to figure out their groove. They're not quite a rebuild. They're somewhere in the weird middle where there's are there are pieces that you can go ahead and figure out what to do with, but there are pieces that you need to add, and in order to add, you have to trade. So all that to say, Danny Age will trade Lori Markin, but he is going to try to get the house, the kitchen sink, the garage, all the dogs, <laughs> and maybe, you know, a future grandkid in the mix. That's just how he does business. So that that's what he's waiting on. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would like to see Laurie Markin and maybe even find a home with Golden State if they can figure out. I think Wiggins needs a, a new home. Uh, so if they can figure out, yeah, you're pairing him with Steph Curry and obviously Draymond Green, you lost a lot of shooting um, with Clay Thompson. I know they made the trade for uh, Buddy Hill. Uh, but I, I think, you know, in this situation, DeAnthony Milton was a nice pickup for Golden State signing a one-year deal, but I would I believe that if he can find his way to Golden State, uh, not sure if Golden State has enough trade assets to send back. They probably got to get a a third team involved. He would be a a nice fit next to uh, Steph Curry. Gonna get the house, the kitchen sink, a dog, and the grandkids, whole, and the grandkids. Danny Age wants it all. The whole family. <laughs> Zero whole point interest rates. He wants it all. <laughs> Nothing. Avery Anderson. So for Buddy Heald, the idea is obviously that he can fill a Clay Thompson-esque role as a movement shooter off the bench, right? And that makes some sense because Buddy Heald is the poor man's version of Clay Thompson. Indiana used him a little differently. He set a lot of on-ball screens for Tyrese Halliburton, like ghost screens. That was one of the most common actions. Before, before the Pacers made all their trades, it was like Miles Turner pick and pop with Halliburton buddy yield go screens those are like the two primary actions that they ran the most and so uh buddy Heald got a lot of reps that registered as like a uh, ball uh pick and roll roll man reps because technically he's setting the ball screen and rolling but he's popping to the to the three-point line but that technically is like an off-screen movement shooter type of role and then he did do a lot of work in movement shooting situations coming off of off ball screens as well with the Pacers now uh and, and obviously very small sample size with the Sixers but he did some work in that department as well now to be clear Clay Thompson is better than Buddy Heald in every way Clay got 1.1 points per shot attempt on off-screen plays Buddy Heald got 0.89 on much lower volume Clay converted spot ups at 1.08 points per play Buddy was at 1.01 Clay ran 208 ball screens and got over a point per possession. Buddy ran uh, 89 of them and got 0 0.89 points per possession. Clay ran 58 ISOs and got 61 points. That's 1.05 points per possession. Buddy ran 18 and got 10. That's 0 0.56 points per possession. Clay's bigger. He's got uh, a better ability to get to his spots to be an on-ball creator. Clay is a substantially better defensive player. The one thing I'd say that this at this point that Buddy does better is he's just a little bit more active on the glass because he's faster so we can get to some of those like 
like long rebound type of situations and he rebounded at a higher rate last year than Klay Thompson. But Klay Thompson's a better player than Buddy Heal. That said, Buddy can reasonably fill that role at a heavily discounted price. And that's why this move makes a lot of sense. He is a very natural fit within the Warriors offense. Again, when we talk about the Warriors offense, it's five out with a combination of like screening passing fulcrums and moving movement shooters, right? The screening passing fulcrums, these are all the guys over the years, like Draymond Green, like Kevon Looney, like Andrew Bogut in the early years. Uh, Andre Godala did a lot of this as well. You know, these are guys that like weren't necessarily dead eye three point shooters, but guys that could just be really smart basketball players that knew how to make the right reads as they're operating in space that knew how to keep flowing into the next action to try to get their movement shooters opportunities. And then accentuating those guys were these movement shooters. And over the years, that's been a bunch of different guys. Obviously, it's been Stephen Clay, it's been KD, it's been Jordan Poole, it's been, you know, uh, uh, some other on-ball guys like Leandro Barbosa and, and, and Sean Livingston, right? But at the end of the day, it's like offensive threats coming off of screens and guys who can set screens and then capitalize on attention devoted to the guys coming off of those screens. Kyle Anderson fits magically into that type of role. We're going to talk about him in just a couple of minutes, but Kyle Anderson is just another guy that's a very good decision maker, screen and roll guy who operates out of the middle of the floor. And then you've got Buddy Heald as another uh, movement shooter. And Buddy Heald, by the way, also just brings three-point volume. He took seven three-point attempts per game last year combined in the two destinations and shot 39% on them. So it just kind of adds that influx of three-point volume to try to replace some of what Clay Thompson brings to the table. Now, as I said, like uh, these guys have their issues, but I like these additions because neither guy should be in their core five-man lineup. When you look at these views, uh, these moves through the lens of being like fringe, like outside of the starting lineup, guys who are like your seventh or eighth man, when you look at them through that context, they actually make a ton of sense. Like, Buddy Heald has his issues. He's not an efficient on-ball creator. He's at his best when he's being set up with an advantage. Clay Thompson was a better on-ball creator than Buddy Heald, obviously. Buddy's undersized. He's a mediocre athlete. But he's perfectly fine as a rotational bench guard. And he is a very natural fit within the offense, which should allow you to maximize what you get out of Buddy Heald. Kyle Anderson has his issues. Smart defenses dare Kyle Anderson to score the basketball, and he can struggle with that. He's a bad jump shooter. He's a mediocre mid-range pull-up jump shooter. He's okay, like just barely over 40% in like hook to floater range, that like kind of short range area. He shoots just 52% on layups. So like, yeah, he's got his issues, but he's an excellent defender with a lot of versatility. He was actually the best defender guarding Luka in the Western Conference Finals last year. He's a really smart playmaker. He's actually one of the best assist turnover guys in the league. 4.2 assists to just 1.2 turnovers last year. Really good decision maker in the middle of the floor. He's a quality rotation piece. These are guys that as long as you don't need to close games with them, they can really help you. And on nights when Buddy Heal has it going, and maybe DeAnthony Melton isn't uh, playing as well, Buddy Heal is an option there, but you don't need to go that route. These are guys that you're not depending on for massive roles. You're depending on them in bench roles. And within that context, I really like it. So the Warriors this summer already have bolstered their rotation with a quality starter in DeAnthony Melton, in my opinion, provided that he's healthy, in two good rotation pieces. And I've talked about this extensively, but I love DeAnthony Melton's game. If he's healthy, he's your starting two guard. And so then you start to look at their best lineups and you go, okay, Steph Curry, top 10 player in the league, DeAnthony Melton, bona fide, really good high level starter at the two guard, Andrew Wiggins, bona fide, really high level starter at the three, and Draymond Green, who's one of the best defensive players in the league. That's a good core four to have in terms of your core lineups. Now, the question is, who's that fifth guy? Now, in the short term, it's probably Kaminga, right? But Steve Kerr has been on the record that he doesn't love the idea of Kaminga and Wiggins playing together. They're two inconsistent shooters. They don't have a lot of feel for the game from those two spots. And that's really, that's the most important thing when we talk about Kaminga is like the fit is a little clunky in Golden State. 
because this is a five out offense where read and react and quick decision making, quick quality decision making is vitally important. And that's one of Kaminga's biggest weaknesses right now. That's why I love the Kyle Anderson fit. Say what you want about him. He's an excellent decision maker who will operate well in five out. As we look at, uh, as I talked about through the Warriors history, that type of player has been so very important, right? So this is where the Lori Markinen rumors come in. Because Kaminga is that fifth guy to me, is the odd man out. He's the one guy that like is going to cause that lineup to fail reaching the level on both ends of the floor that it needs to reach. Now, to be clear, before we go any further on Lori, the Warriors might just not have enough to get Lori Markinen. Like, if a team like the San Antonio Spurs decides that they really want to put their best offer together, they'd probably win that bidding war. So the question is, should the Warriors consider including Jonathan Kaminga in a potential deal for Laurie Markkinen? And I think the answer is very clearly yes. And so I'm going to make the case for that now. I have three reasons why. Three reasons why I think the Warriors should include Jonathan Kaminga in a deal for Laurie if that's what it takes. Number one... Jonathan Kaminga has all-star upside, but he does not appear to have superstar upside. I'm a big believer in Jonathan Kaminga. He's like a truly transcendent athlete. Talked about this a lot last year, but nobody can keep him in front when he makes quick lateral moves out of the high post when he's attacking with a triple threat or even out of the post. Like that was why that was why he was so successful in the post last year. That's why he drew so many fouls because he was getting defenders out of position. He's an intriguing defender with a lot of upside. I like him a little better on the ball than off the ball right now. I think he'll have multiple seasons as an NBA player where he averages over 20 points per game. And I think that he'll probably make an all-star team at some point. But he has not shown. What what Jonathan Kaminga has clearly not shown to this point is that multifaceted dominance that you typically see from foundational superstars right around this point in their careers. You see flashes of it, and we did not see that with Kaminga. In my opinion, Jonathan Kaminga's absolute ceiling, like the best player he could be, would be what Jalen Brown has become. And that is a huge compliment. Jalen Brown just won a finals MVP. But Jalen Brown is somewhere around the 15th best player in the NBA. That would be an absolute monstrous success story for Jonathan Kaminga. I think it's more likely than not that he doesn't get to that level. But that is his upside. Jalen Brown is not the franchise cornerstone that the guys at the top of the league are. The guys like Shea Gilders, Alexander, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Joel Embiid, Luka Doncic, Nikola Jokic. Jonathan Kaminga has no shot at cracking that tier, right? And so with that being the case, like I don't view him as like a can't miss type of asset. Number two, Laurie Markkinen is also not that type of guy. He's also not a cornerstone type of talent. But he's much further along in his development than Kaminga, and he's a much better natural basketball fit with the Warriors. Laurie Markkinen's not going to be a top 10 guy. He's not going to enter into conversations with Luka Doncic and Joel Embiid and those guys at the top of the league. But he's much further along he averaged 25 points and eight rebounds per game in his last two seasons with the utah jazz 49 percent from the field 40 percent from three 89 percent from the line 64 percent true shooting percentage 25 and 8 on 64 percent true shooting you would be thrilled if jonathan kaminga became that laurie markinen is already that And I know it's not a perfect player comp. They're very different types of players. But in terms of value to a franchise, you aspire that Jonathan Kamiga might be able to become as valuable around the league or as good as as Laurie Markkinen has been as, as an NBA player the last two seasons. That would be a quality outcome for Jonathan. And so you're just getting someone that fits more within the timeline. And then he's a beautiful fit within the Warriors offense. He's an excellent spot up guy. He converted spot up possessions at 1.10 points per possession last year. Good movement shooter. He shot 45% coming off of screens last year. That's 1.11 points per shot. He's a great cutter. He's a great pick and pop big in ball screens with Steph Curry. That would be uh, deadly. He's a high level read and react player in five out. He is just a much more natural basketball fit with the Warriors than Jonathan Kaminga. 
And then the third reason why you'd have to include him, you have Steph Curry on your team. And you're not planning on trading him. So stop focusing on what some of these young players can be and give Steph as much support as you can because you owe that to him. And Lori allows you to do both. Lori allows you to give real, genuine support to Steph Curry in the short term while also having an asset for the long term of the franchise. He's 27 years old. He's got a lot of great basketball left in him. If, to be clear, if I actually thought that Jonathan Kaminga could become a foundational franchise cornerstone type of prospect, then I wouldn't even consider having this conversation. But he's not. Like, if he's not like a perennial MVP vote getter, then then it doesn't make sense. And again, I understand from a different perspective if you don't have Steph Curry on the roster. You don't trade... Like, for instance, if you're the Utah Jazz and you're looking for your franchise cornerstone and you have Kaminga and you want Laurie Markkinen, that doesn't make any sense because Laurie Markkinen's not that guy either. You're better off betting on Kaminga's upside and maintaining whatever other assets that you have. The Warriors have Steph Curry. The Warriors have Draymond Green. The Warriors have a certain obligation to try to make this work. And, 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 and that, to me, is is where you have to consider this type of deal. Here's my last note on it before we move on. Lori gives you a clear five to start and end games with. Steph, DeAnthony, Melton, Andrew Wiggins, Draymond Green, and Jonathan Kaminga, clunky, not enough shooting. Not enough high IQ players on the wing. Steph, DeAnthony, Melton, Andrew Wiggins, Lori Markinen, and Draymond Green, plenty of shooting, plenty of guys that know how to play read and react five out basketball on the perimeter. That five has the upside of a championship team. I wouldn't put them at the top of that tier, but like I'd put them up in the rest of the Western Conference at least. I'd put them up there with, you know, every team that's below that Denver OKC Boston tier. They're just as good as all those teams if they get Laurie Markin in. And then anything could happen. Who knows? Maybe Steph does get back to MVP level next year and you become a championship contender. Maybe you do have the ability to make a smaller move on the margins at the deadline to push yourself up another level. But Laurie Markkinen is the only guy that can put you into that conversation. If you keep Jonathan Kaminga and you go with Steph, the Anthony Melton, Andrew Wiggins, Kaminga, and Draymond, you're a play-in team. So, I mean, here's the thing. It's possible that Laurie Markkinen is just outside of Golden State's price range, but if you have to include Kaminga to make a deal like that happen, it's time for the Warriors to consider a risky move. For years, the Warriors played conservatively, re-signing their veteran stars while using draft picks on young prospects. That was the two-timeline strategy championed by owner Joe Lacob. While it brought them victory in the 2022 NBA Finals, it proved inadequate to sustain their dynasty. The upcoming offseason emerges as a critical moment for the Golden State Warriors, ready to reshape the franchise's trajectory. Will they commit to one last attempt at winning the championship or will they opt for a financial restructuring? Mike Dunleavy Jr. and the front office face a series of daunting choices, leaving fans eager to discover the team's next moves. Expectations surrounding Golden State's future intensify. Before you finish, make sure to subscribe to the channel. After all, as we said before, we are producing Warriors videos almost every day. Thanks for watching, we'll see you tomorrow on Gold-Blooded News. In conclusion, the future looks uncertain for the Golden State Warriors. With the possibility of losing and adding players to the team and the various trade options available, the Warriors are well positioned to continue to be a force to be reckoned with in the NBA. Stay tuned for more updates on the Warriors and remember to support by leaving your feedback in the comments section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Turn on notifications to know when I will send new news. Thank you for following Gold Blooded News. A hug and see you next time. We're Gold Blooded! Go Dubs!